thank you. So, um, yeah, so thank, thank you everyone for coming. And again, I'm very much, very apologies, A, for being late and B, for being unprepared. But uh, I know many, if not most, if not all of you actually, but my name is James Reed. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist um, at the Mental Health Trust in Birmingham. Um, I am also, um, I want to do some work on the clinic, the shared care records program in the West Midlands. And I also work in industry for a, a software company called InterSystems, who by coincidence perhaps are also the supplier of the shared care record product we use in, in Birmingham Solid Health, uh, among other things. So I've got a few hats and a few takes on this subject. And then I've been working for a supplier now for about eight months. Um, and it's been an eye opening experience, I think it's fair to say. Um, fascinating, as always, to see the world that you think you understand from a, a different point of view. Um, and I certainly have a lot more sympathy, I have to be honest, for suppliers than I used to, uh, having having seen it from, from their side of the fence for a while. Um, in particular, when it comes to things like procurement. Um, and I think one of the, the most, uh, I think I've told some of you this, one of the most interesting things that happened in the first few weeks was that I went to a meeting in the NHS where we were talking about procurement and everyone was grumbling about it saying, well, you know, procurement's dreadful in the NHS. It's stacked against the NHS. It's all in favour of suppliers. You know, we get a bad deal. And then I went to a meeting with my, in my industry job a few days later. We were saying, well, the procurement process in the NHS is absolutely terrible. It's stacked against the, uh, it's stacked against the suppliers. It's all in favour of the NHS. No, it doesn't. We come out of it really badly. So it was most interesting. And I think having been involved in some bids and stuff like that since, I have got a lot of, in, insight actually into what happens when uh, on the other side of the fence when these things land. So that's that. It's that, that's an aside. I'm assuming we can talk about some of the time. But the, the question about what we you know, what we do about with systems about solving clinical problems and how we solve them, where we get them from, is is really interesting. So in my trust, we've we've had the experience of buying an off the shelf system. So we use a an EPR product called Rio, which is probably the market leader. You know, not that it's a very big market for uh, mental health systems in the UK, well in England anyway. Um, and we've had that for maybe 12, 13 years, something like that. But we also built from scratch um, a well, what's turned into quite a complex system, which is designed primarily from psychiatric inpatient units. Um, and that we'd be started down that road because when, when we were looking at our requirements for it, Rio, the product just didn't support it at all. So we really had no choice but to but to build things ourselves. Um, I think, you know, looking back on it now, I think it's certainly true that had, the, had our supplier been able to meet our requirements at that point, we would never, we wouldn't have started down this route, but but they didn't. Uh, and so what began, <laughs> excuse me, what began as a fairly small scale kind of hobby project to, to have a go at meeting a need has actually evolved into what's now quite a large scale system that actually, you know, covers the full range of activities in an inpatient ward on which we've now I really think struggled to do without. So we've, we've done a bit of both um, and so as a result I think we have got, I think I've had some experience of, of, of both and, and so um, I've been thinking a lot about what we do because I suppose the problem when you buy a system from a supplier and again I can see this from the supplier side as well is, is you know you're buying an established product um, it depends exactly what it is, but it's been designed in a particular way. It's probably been shaped by former, well, it's likely shaped by former customers. Um, and it's probably been shaped by former customers at a different time. You know, I mean, most of the mature established systems are by definition quite old because they're mature and established. So Rio can chart its origins back at least 20 years. Um, and Every day, you know, you are confronted with things in it that you know are based on design decisions that were made, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And you can see sometimes why those decisions were made based on what the view of the prevailing view at the time was. But still, matters have moved on. But these things are often so fundamental because they're, they're a fundamental part of the design that it's very difficult to do anything about it. Um, and also, of course, people over the years sort of get used to doing things in a particular way because the system works that way without necessarily stopping to think whether that's actually a very good idea or it's even needed anymore. Uh, I mean, there's, I mean, if again, to give a specific, in, in Rio, for example, those of well, John and others will be familiar with the concept of validated progress notes, which is a thing in Rio whereby you can write a note and you tick a box to say that it's valid, you know, or it's completed. And that causes, has caused us all manner of problems because people have left, you know, people leave these notes unvalidated and everyone gets worried about well, that's not a validated progress note, but actually the whole thing is a completely artificial construct. It doesn't really mean anything at all. It's just, I am sure 
based off a decision. Someone said 20 years ago, well, staff need to be able to sign their notes because that's the paradigm they had at the time. And so this thing, the whole thing has been built and constructed. It doesn't actually serve any useful function. Everyone gets very annoyed about it and worries about it and they spend loads of effort into something, but it, it, it doesn't actually matter. But because it's central to the product, you can't do anything about it, you're stuck with it. Um, and that sort of thing I think happens a lot. And, and what you find then, of course, is your power to do anything about this is restricted. I think, silly, when you buy software, it's like buying anything else, really. Suppliers are interested in new customers. You know, there's this concept, this phrase I've learned with my supplier hat on, there's what new logos, that's what the sales managers are excited about. They want to get new a new logo to stick on their website to say, we've got a new customer. That's really, that's what they want to know. Because that's, you know, it, it shows if you're a salesperson, it shows that you're doing something good, you're going out, you're grabbing new business, you know, you're increasing the revenue that's coming into the company. That's all good stuff. Um, of course, keeping the existing customers happy isn't a much it is less interest, to be honest, because you're already paying your money. They've already got you. So from a sales point of view, you know, there's no news in it. It's not many, there's not much news in keeping your existing customers. There's news if you lose customers, of course, which is something different. But I think you see this in every industry. You know, we've all had it with, you know, Virgin Media or I don't know, car insurance or anything else. It's the new customers that get the attention and the best deals and all the rest of it. And if you're an existing customer, you're kind of punished by your premiums gradually going up in the background and, and everyone's hoping you're not going to do anything about it. And I think it's it's a thing that is just as true in, in software as it is in any other industry. Um, and so, I mean, what we've found again over many years is that getting simple changes made to the product is actually very difficult because we may regard it as a priority. You know, we may sometimes may even be willing to pay for it, perhaps. But if the supplier doesn't regard it as a priority, then it's just in, it is, it's very unlikely to happen. Um, because you know, with something big like this, taking your business elsewhere isn't really an option. I mean, and everyone knows this. I mean, for us to move off our system would be a mammoth undertaking, extremely expensive, and the likelihood is whatever we ended up with would probably be no better than what we've got. So, and again, everyone knows this. So, your ability to sort of wield that threat that we're going to leave, it's that isn't going to happen, particularly over something minor. Um, and then on the supplier side, I mean, they don't, all suppliers have a limited amount of resource. They only have X number of developers. I mean, it might be a lot of developers, but still there's only so many of them and they've all got work to do. Um, so, you know, we may want to make something. I mean, again, there's some screen in Rio I'd like to see updated and I might think it's a good idea and I might even have the money to pay for it. But if the suppliers don't want to hire any more developers to do it and don't see it important, they just won't do it. And, and I think we've all probably had that experience with, with, with products that we're using, where there's things about them, often quite fundamental, boring, simple things that really could do being improved. But there's really no, but you feel completely powerless to do anything about it. Um, the flip side, of course, is that if you have an established product, then, you know, you've got support contracts in place. You know, you've got robust arrangements. You know, you've got a supplier whose job it is to sort things out if they go wrong. And that who, you know, you, you on in general terms, you can rely on and also who is external to your organisation. So all you have to do is to keep things going is pay the money, keep the contracts running, make sure the terms of them are OK. And effectively, you're outsourcing your risk to that supplier. Now, of course, that doesn't always work. I mean, the very famous, if you have any of you are aware of this, but there was a massive um, cyber attack on the on the developer called Advanced, or one advanced thing they're called these days, who are a big public sector supplier the NHS and they supply all sorts of things from uh, 111 systems like Ad Astra through to some system that's to do with smart card authentication but they're also including a mental health system called Care Notes which was used among other things by um, Birmingham Children's Hospital and they had a major cyber attack um, on their infrastructure which was poorly architected and the result they lost like in uh, 20 or 30 of their systems were completely offline in August last year, they got most of them back fairly quickly, but the mental health system was off for about four to six months. And that's a long, long, long time to have no EPR. And that and that's caused a lot of um, consternation, as you can imagine, an example of where you can have everything in place. You can have your contracts you can have everything you think all right. But then if something goes wrong with the supplier, again, you really don't have anything much you can do about it. So those are the kind of pluses and minuses. And then, of course, the other side of the coin is developing things yourself. So I say we we did this. So we um, we had a, a specific requirement to use uh, systems for inpatients because Rio is first and foremost a community system. Really, and that's what it basically does. Um, 
but uh, but obviously we also have inpatient wards. It's got a limited amount of inpatient functionality. But what it didn't do really was any kind of real time work. So it was no use to doing things like um, observations. And our particular need back in whenever it was 2016 or thereabouts was to have some proper system for, for doing our inpatient observations. We were always in trouble over it. It was a major issue for CQC, everybody else. We had patient deaths where observations were implicated. So it's something we need to do something about. And it was quite clear that Rio, the product, couldn't do it. So we just said, well, look, we, there, was, there was nothing else out there that could. We had a small development team who felt that this was a thing they could do. And so we got them to do it. So they, they, so they really went away in a very kind of quite a clean room approach, really looked at the problem and went away, designed from scratch a solution um, that would meet that need. And it was also tightly integrated with the other systems we had. So we were able to build integrations out of Rio and out of our active directory and various other things to make sure the whole thing fitted together very neatly. Um, and the big advantage, of course, there was we were designing something ourselves. We had complete control over every aspect of it. You know, we could deal with our staff and exactly the way that they work uh, and design something that met that exact need. And we were quite careful, I suppose, not to ask the nurses in this case what it should be like, we simply asked them to, to, to outline what the need was. And then the developers were able to go away and construct something that actually didn't look anything like a traditional observations chart, but actually but what it did do was, was meet the need. Um, so, and we and, and it was done sort of on, you know, the advantage of course, there was, wasn't a big project. I mean, this was almost like a kind of skunk works thing done slightly under the radar, out of the way, just to, just to see if it could be done. Um, and so that was worked on for, you know, quite a while in the end, best part of a year, I think, before we finally got it finished. Um, and then again, in a fairly kind of low key manner, we got it out to a few wars to see or to see if it would work at all for a start and then to see how well it worked. And actually, you know, and as you fully gathered, it was a big success. You know, it's, it's not only did this, it is you know, met a lot of the shortcomings that the system we've got had had, we were able to learn quite a few lessons from it and design them that met the exact need. Um, and then we got some additional money coming in from national funds, which allowed us to push it out to the whole organisation. So really, within a very short space of time, we went from having a entirely paper based um, clipboard based system for doing observations. Suddenly it was based off, you know, tablets and mobile phone devices with data flowing around, everything driven out of Rio um, and actually brought lots of genuine innovations the way observations were done. You know, things that sound obvious, but simple stuff like making sure the patient's photograph was available at the point of observing so you knew who the patient was um, and um, and some care planning details and various other things. Um, so that was a big, and that was a great example, I suppose, of something that we could never have done. I mean, even if we'd have hired an external developer, I think that would have been very difficult um, because they would have fully wanted, they would have wanted a detailed specification requirements and all. We didn't really have that. You know, we built this up slowly because it was our own staff who knew people who were embedded and could wander around the wards, talk to people, gather stuff together and use it to build something. Um, and then when it was done, of course, we were able to do it in a sort of textbook agile way um, to iterate and iterate and iterate and develop quickly. And you could show, you know, but we got to the stage of being able to listen to the listen to the feedback in the, on the Monday afternoon, go away, do the developer during the week and present a solution on Friday morning. The kind of timescales that you just are very difficult to see with any commercial product. I mean, you know, we have bought got commission stuff from the server like or the access group over the years. It's always been very painful. You know, it's been very slow. It took us two and a half years, for example, to get a delivered piece of code to build an interface with the ICE results system. Whereas this, by comparison, is lightning fast, you know, and, and also it uses whatever the, you know, we were able to use the most up-to-date technology we could find. We weren't bound by any sort of technical debt or whatever. And what we've done since with that is the same thing. We've got a gang of enthused nurses who are really keen on this, who are able to rapidly generate ideas the developers liked it because they could get stuck in quickly they could build things they could produce them and um, they could get them into the wards in, in use and then move on to the next one so we've ended up with seven or eight different modules this now and it, it's a really good it's a really nice system uh, and it still is not matched by anything else i've seen in, in mental health services so that's all great isn't it but of course the flip side of all this and as i said really is that we we did this with a small agile team of developers and the problem with small agile teams is they is that it only takes one of them to decide to leave or to be not available. And all of a sudden you've lost a large portion of your of your a your knowledge of be your development. And this has actually happened. So our lead developer who really had championed this from the outset 
left about a month ago. Um, and, and he'd been with us for, oh, I don't know, nine, ten years or so. So, I mean, and he actually was involved in all kinds of things um, across. So he had an awful lot of knowledge, not only about this digital war system, but also about various other things, too. And he's now left. And, and we're going to have a discussion about why we have or why we can have problems with retaining highly skilled technical staff in the NHS. But certainly the agenda for change pay scale does not help us at all. Uh, and we, we found ourselves in a situation where we couldn't, you know, because of the restrictions around banding jobs, it was very difficult to pay people what they were, what we what we knew they were worth, and certainly to to retain people who could see with the sort of skills, the high level technical skills you need to these sorts of jobs, it's very easy to go off into industry, you know, like in systems, for example, and get paid substantially more money for doing a very similar task. Uh, and similarly, you can get to um, you very you quickly hit a bit of a ceiling in technical type jobs within the NHS because there's never even anywhere to go. If you don't want, especially if you don't want to be a senior manager or something, which lots of people don't, you just want to be practicing your technical skills. Um, it, it's difficult to find somewhere to go and people will get. And, in, and this is what we've seen. People do get attracted by other industries and other areas and they leave. And so the problem that we that one faces then is that if you've spent a small number of people invested a lot into this, they hold all the knowledge. And you can get them to write it all down and document it and everything. We we have all that, but still, as as proponents of open source have found over the years, it's all very well having code. It's all very well having documented code, but still, somebody new coming in, picking it up, and understanding it all is a difficult task. Um, and so you can you know, you are in danger. There's a lot of risk. You're holding a lot of risk that you've got this business critical system that only a relatively small group of people understand. And it's then if they don't stay or they leave or whatever else, suddenly you can find yourself in trouble. So we're probably, you know, if, if you know, one or two other staff decided to leave, we could find ourselves in a situation where we didn't have anyone left who knew enough about the product to be able to support it, which would be a, a disaster from our point of view. Um, so that's the that's the flip side of it. So on the one hand, so the, the good points of in-house developments are you get stuff done quickly, you get it done well, you get it done exactly to your requirements, and you get it done cheaply. The flip side is you then have to hold all the risks and the complications that there are effectively running a software development house, especially when for most NHS organisations, running a software development house is not your core business. Uh, and again, you find things like the pay scales and stuff which do not assist you in doing that. Um, it's a bit of an existential crisis, and I think we've seen this in the US, certainly. I mean, up until about, you know, I don't know how long, 10, 15 years ago, it was a lot of big US hospitals did run their own, you know, software development and they had their own systems. Um, and some of them very established, well developed, been around a long time. Same goes with the Veterans Administration, which very famously was using a um, open source product called Vista, which had been in-house developed over many years. But basically, when the large influxes of money came into US healthcare, without exception, they've all now stopped doing that. So all the big American providers have all now shipped across to one or other of the big suppliers like Epic or Cerner or Oracle, Oracle is now, or whoever, uh, Meditech and so on. Uh, none of them have continued. And I think the reason for that is, is because of these long-standing continuing risks that, that you hold if you try to run a software development operation as well. So um, so that's the dilemma. You know, what do you do? Because on the one hand, you can go and buy the, you know, follow the traditional route and go and buy it for supply, but at the same time know that whatever it is you're getting is not going to meet all of your needs um, and will probably have some big gaps. Um, or on the other hand, you know, you charge off with your developers, you build something that's perfect, but then you run the risk of it, of it not being sustainable in the medium to long term. I mean, there are some middle grounds that people have talked about. I mean, the most, and I think over the years, we have seen people try once or twice and set up sort of foundations because, again, the open source world, you'll know, there's a few big projects like Ubuntu and so on that are on Red Hat and that are actually operated by commercial operations. And they don't sell the software generally, they don't sell the base software. So all that's open source available. What they do sell is all the support services that you need to make it work. Because to a large extent, I think I've come to realize this, in the end with software, it doesn't really matter whether it's what you're, what you're paying. It doesn't matter whether you're paying license fees for software, whether you're paying support costs. You you have to pay for it by some means if you want it to work. Um, so ideologically, it doesn't really matter to me whether it's open source or not, because I'm still going to have to pay. Um, so there is a, a school of thought that says, well, what we perhaps should be doing with these in-house development products is, getting, is, is freeing them from single organizations and making them into you know, perhaps they're open source entities or some kind of 
external body or foundation or group of trusts that are willing to own this and can collaborate can contribute development effort and so on to keep it running and have some kind of independent body that oversees the design and then and, and use of it something like that and there was a lot of excitement around that and yeah we you know in nhs england about no oh, oh, that's nine ten years ago now um, and people were talking about the veterans administration software vista and could this be used in the nhs and should we have some kind of foundation and they set up this thing called the aperta foundation i don't know if you've heard of that which seems to have died a death now really but which was supposed to be doing this kind of thing and a few projects were started but it hasn't really worked out unfortunately so that that group so far hasn't hasn't brought any fruit but on the other hand it still might because what we do have in, in england anyway is quite a few organizations large and small that have built stuff a bit like our digital ward system or perhaps at the other end of the spectrum like uhb's pick system which are you know big pieces of work that are well established a lot of experience behind them but yet are at risk um and I think especially at the moment with all the scrutiny that there is on this, like Tanya was saying, at one point we were there was a lot of emphasis on pushing everyone to, you know, to do NHS, build NHS own stuff. And now very much the message, well, certainly from Tim Ferriss, although of course he's now gone, but I don't think it's need to change very much. He's about, you know, buying in big established systems and we're seeing these massive epic developments and so on going on at the moment. Um, I don't really know, I mean, obviously, Sitting in a supplier now it gives me a slightly different view of it as well. Um, but I, I, I don't really know what what the right thing is. I mean, there is no right answer, of course. Um, but I am nervous. I have to be honest about how we're going to. Those of us who are doing this sort of in-house development work are going to sustain it long term. You know, um, I think it may prove to be difficult, and we might have to look at other models. Um, I'd love to see examples in healthcare, particularly in the NHS, of people. You know. Well, I mean, it's not the open sourcing bit, but people are actually setting products free of their organisations and making them into something that's community owned. I think that might that would be a potential solution. We've seen, you know, out there there are lots of examples of community owned projects that work. Um, but you do need to have a critical mass. And you do need to have people willing. And of course, the reason that open source often works is because a lot of volunteers, people are willing to do it completely for you know, out there, out of their own, the goodness of their hearts to work on these things and their passion projects and so on. I'm not sure how many people we have willing to do that in in healthcare. You know, I haven't seen it, but but perhaps. Um, so yeah, so that that's probably off the top of my head, Tanya. All I've got to say. But I'd be interested to hear views, and maybe we can have a bit of discussion about it. Um, 